Today I would like to talk to you about diabetes and the importance of understanding it so you're able to not only care for your clients that have diabetes but also educate them and um, make them independent for caring for themselves. So some of the things I want to start with is just some statistics regarding diabetes and the prevalence of it. When we look at our non-Hispanic white um, population, they have about a 10.8% um, incidence of diabetes as compared to our African Americans who have almost a 19% um, incidence or risk for having diabetes. Not only do they have that higher incidence, they're also at greater risk um, for developing some of the comorbidities that go along with it, the coronary heart disease, cerebrovascular accidents, and end-stage renal disease. Our Hispanic Latino Americans, they have about a 9.5 percent incidence of diabetes, and then when we look at our American Indians and our Alaska Natives, they're about 2.2 times more likely to have diabetes um, than the non-Hispanic whites. So we can see that this is definitely a disease that's prevalent in our society, and with that comes along a lot of money and health care time, energy. It's very taxing, so it's important that nurses understand um, how, how can we get our patients to better manage it? Because diabetes has so many other comorbidities that go along with it. So that's exactly what this presentation is going to do, cover some of the basic pathophys and then get into um, disease management. So diabetes, it's a disorder of hyperglycemia. What we're going to see is higher levels of glucose in the blood. And this is due to either the body's inability to produce insulin or the inability to produce sufficient amounts of the insulin or once the insulin is there, inability to actually um, utilize the insulin. And this is going to lead to abnormalities with metabolism and both your carbohydrate, fat, and protein. And this ends up leading to structure and function of blood vessels that um, can deteriorate and that's when you start seeing some of the side effects or the manifestations of long-term diabetes. One of the words that you might hear out there nowadays is diabesity. It's a little bit newer term, but they're trying to show you the link between diabetes and obesity. So when we look at the different forms of or types of diabetes, we can see type 1 here, which makes up about 5% of all diabetes. You tend to see it in your younger population, um, your children, adolescents, and these guys um, actually stop producing insulin and they become insulin dependent. Whereas type 2 accounts for 90 to 95 percent of all diabetes. It used to be um, referred to as adult onset. Unfortunately, nowadays we're starting to see more and more of type 2 diabetes in our younger population and that has to do with lack of activity and obesity. Gestational diabetes is one that um, obviously our pregnant women will develop um, during pregnancy and this topic will actually be covered during your maternity class. As far as the other specific types, we're not really going to focus on them, but they're related to either problems with the pancreas, problems with um, beta cells. Um, you might have some issue with some of your different hormones, and so that's kind of a small clustering of specific types of diabetes. Some of the different hormones that are out there um, that we need to have an, a little bit of an idea on is our um, glucagon, insulin, and somatostatin. And when we talk about glucagon, um, it is actually produced by the alpha cells and it responds to a drop in blood glucose levels. So glucagon is going to raise the blood glucose levels when needed.
Your beta cells actually produce your insulin and they respond to change in blood glucose. And so they're going to actually decrease your blood glucose levels. Your delta cells um, produce somatostatin and it actually decreases and assists in regulating insulin and glucagon. So they're secreted um, into the bloodstream and are able to respond accordingly. Our bodies require a constant supply of glucose. So with glucagon, the major action is to increase the blood glucose by converting that glycogen to glucose in the liver. Whereas the somatostatin that we spoke of is going to lower the blood glucose by interfering with um, the release of growth hormone from the pituitary and glucagon from the pancreas. I don't want you to get hung up on the um, pathophys of this. I just want you to understand what's going to ri raise and what's going to lower because in the end that's what we need to know as nurses. Not all tissues re require resulting insulin, but um, there is a normal blood glucose in healthy clients that is going to always be regulated by insulin and glucagon. It ranges from about 70 to 110, and that's from the American Diabetes Association. Um, sometimes you'll see 130, but they're trying to lower that in hopes that we can check and get control of it earlier versus later when we talk about that blood sugar. This slide here is a visual showing you you have high blood glucose levels, so the pancreas is going to release that insulin, the cells are going to take that insulin in, and that blood glucose is going to fall. So for those of you that need the visual, in the next slide here, is going to show us what happens with a low blood glu blu ah, a low blood glucose level. You're going to have that pancreas release the glucagon and the liver is going to go ahead and break it down and the blood glucose level is going to rise. So some other hormones that can actually affect the blood glucose level Sorry about that. We have um, the somatostatin that we spoke of. And then we also have epinephrine that um, our body produces during periods of stress. That's going to cause that blood sugar to rise. Corticosteroids, your body produces them normally, or we oftentimes will give them artificially in the hospital to help with inflammation. And so um, maybe a patient's never a diabetic, but they come in with a pneumonia, and we're giving them a corticosteroid, and now all of a sudden they have high blood sugar, and we need to manage those um, blood glucose levels. Growth hormone and thyroid hormone can also cause a rise in our blood glucose levels. And that's exactly what this slide is showing us, which ones lower the blood glucose, our insulin and our somatostatin, and which hormones raise that blood glucose level, our glucagon, and then um, epicorticosteroids, and then the growth and or thyroid hormones. So type 1 diabetes, what's actually going on with type 1? Um, for some reason, there's a destruction of the pancreatic cells, and oftentimes they believe it's autoimmune, um, idiopathic, maybe they don't know. There's definitely a genetic component to it. They're starting to see more and more of that higher incidence if a family member has type 1. So it most often occurs in childhood. Um, like I said, there is a ch genetic predisposition for it. And they're also looking at um, what are some environmental factors that may, you know, did the child have the flu or some type of illness that um, a virus got in and possibly is the culprit for destroying that pancreas. Um, they're looking at that as well. 
but um, you can see there um, one in 400 in the general population versus one in 20 um, to one in 50 of ch um, ch incidents of a child having diabetes um, if a family member has one. So what are some of the common symptoms that our diabetics present with? Oftentimes with our type 1, they come in with that hyperglycemia. And that's usually one of the first things. Um, prior to it, uh, you might see they have an increased thirst, increased hunger, um, but really it's um, they get severely sick, they get the decay and come in, and that's um, when we are first diagnosing these type 1 clients, um, and they're severely hyperglycemic at that point. Really, you know, if we look back, we're able to say, okay, this has been going on, but they don't seek help. Okay, they're thirsty, they're hungry, maybe they're having a growth spurt, and the parents don't um, realize it. And what's actually happening is um, their body begins breaking down um, the fats and proteins, and you can see that um, ketones, and that will lead to that DKA that is oftentimes a presenting sign um, or manifestation. So they have a lack of insulin, um, and uh, the glucose that they do have is unable to um, get into the cell without the insulin, so um, they're hyperglycemic. So if we're going to continue here with our clinical manifestations, some things that we can see, they oftentimes refer to them as your three Ps, your polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia. So extreme um, thirst, hunger, and then um, urination. These guys oftentimes are uh, losing weight because of that breakdown that's occurring. And um, fatigue or malaise, you'll see that as well. Um, they can have some glucose spillover into their urine, um, and you can also um, see ketones spilling over into their urine as well. When we start looking at our type 2, okay, referred to as the adult onset, even though we are well aware that our older popu or younger population is also demonstrating with it, these guys oftentimes are non-insulin dependent diabetes. Don't get that confused. Our type 2 may need insulin, um, but if they're able to lose weight, control their diet, sometimes they don't need the insulin and they can just use um, a hyperglycemic oral pill. Um, and so what's happening here is um, insulin resistance. So um, even if they do produce insulin, it's unable to um, connect with that receptor on the cell and open it up for um, the glucose to be utilized within the cell. Um, so they actually have um, what we call functional impairment or resistance. And the actual insulin that they need exceeds what their body is able to produce. Type 2 can occur at any, any age. Um, usually it's your older. Uh, middle age to older, but like we said, we're starting to see it in our younger and younger. Also, um, you may see it with um, some of the medications that are out there. So we might develop it related to maybe a steroid if they had a organ transplant, and we need to put them on a immunosuppressant or a steroid there. The steroid's going to drive up the blood sugars, and now um, we may develop that type 2. So manifestations um, and risk factors for our type 2, definitely that obesity and the inactivity. Um, we already talked about the different ethnicity and race higher in our African Americans. Um, we can also see increased risk um, not only with the gestational diabetes, but with um, clients that have that polycystic ovary syndrome. They tend to have elevated blood sugars. 
Um, you can see it increased risk with people that have hypertension and metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome we talk about with our cardiac patients. Those are the people that um, carry their weight in that abdominal region. They have elevated triglycerides. Um, they have um, their LDLs are elevated. They have high blood sugars. Um, and they're higher risk for coronary artery disease. As far as their clinical manifestations for our type 2, they're very similar to the type 1. Um, you also want to look and pay attention to those three P's that we mentioned earlier, polydipsia, polyphagia, and polyuria, as well as um, the um, fatigue, malaise. The onset is a little bit slower with our type 2 and um, one of the very initial treatments for these guys is actually weight loss um, and increased activity. So we want to start educating them early on. We don't want to talk to them about an ideal weight loss, but let's start with trying to lose some weight, okay, um, because it can be very daunting if we say, oh, you need to get down to 120. Um, if we can say, let's start by losing 10 pounds and also increasing that activity. That's a great way to manage um, your blood sugars is activity. As far as complications of diabetes, um, this piece of it can be very extensive. Um, that's when we talked about how expensive it is for our health care um, system. It has to do with all of the complications that go along with it. Some of the acute complications um, with our hyperglycemia is that diabetic ketoacidosis with our type 1, our hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state with our type 2, and we're going to talk about that um, in just a minute here. Another complication you may see is the dawn phenomena, and this actually is a rise in the blood glucose um, early in the morning. They usually say around 4 to 8 a.m., but it's not in response to a hypoglycemic episode. Um, they're not actually sure what the cause is, um, but they believe it's related to the nocturnal increase in growth hormone. Um, and that's going to decrease the peripheral uptake of glucose. So these patients have a rise in the blood glucose early in the morning with the dawn phenomena. The Samagi phenomena, what's happening here is they believe um, it's actually related to a rebound of hypoglycemia that occurred during the night. And so you'll see a rise in the morning blood sugars to a hyperglycemic level. And um, this may actually lead to insulin resistance um, for a possible 12 to 48 hours. We're really going to focus here on DKA and hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. So when we talk about our diabetic ketoacidosis, um, there's an absolute deficiency of our insulin um, and the hormones that are going to help regulate that insulin. Um, and so we have increased glucagon, which going, is going to lead to that DKA. Um, and so what we see here is um, hyperosmolarity. You're going to see metabolic acidosis that occurs, as well as extracellular volume depletion. Because of the osmolarity change, um, you're going to see the volume change, okay? So your fluid is going to go into that vascular space and you're going to have extreme urination. So we're going to have volume depletion. And with that, you're go uh, those electrolytes are going to follow and you're going to have electrolyte imbalances. So we lose our volume. So you're going to see problems with perfusion. If I don't have volume, I can't maintain a blood pressure and therefore I can't um, maintain perfusion, as well as uh, my electrolytes are going to become imbalanced. And once we start losing our electrolytes, um, we're going to see problems with possible cardiac function, um, muscle tone. Here is just a visual slide um, showing you what's happening with our um, DKA. And you can see that um, that um, increased 
I'm sorry, decreased uptake of the glucose, um, which is going to lead to that glucogenesis. Um, and um, so we're going to have higher levels of gluce, glucose, which is going to lead to that osmotic diuresis. So sugar is going to draw that water out, and so we're going to lose that volume, like I said, and you're going to have um, volume depletion, and we're going to have problems with our circulation. So um, our s manifestations are severe dehydration and also the electrolyte imbalance, and you're going to have um, severe acidosis. And so these patients need immediate medical attention, and you're going to see them with low blood pressures, um, change in level of consciousness. You need to replace those fluids, and when we talk about that, it's quite a bit of fluid, 8 to 10 liters. Um, and we're going to start with just normal saline, okay, isotonic, and then we're going to move over to a half normal saline, um, a hypotonic. And we're also going to do regular insulin, and regular insulin is the only insulin we can use IV. And so um, these patients may need to be put on an IV drip of insulin, and um, we need to monitor those electrolytes quite vigilantly. The other form of um, severe hyperglycemia is this hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic state. And with this, um, really the big difference is, A, it occurs in our type 2, and um, our blood sugars are also very high, um, but you don't see that breakdown of our ketones, okay, like you do in DKA. It's um, very, very serious. Um, it's a little bit slower onset than our DKA, but you can see some of the same manifestations as far as that um, severe dehydration. Okay, so therefore you want to make sure you correct the fluid um, imbalance as well as your electrolyte imbalance, and we need to decrease our blood glucose levels. You need to remember that um, you cannot change your blood glucose levels drastically, okay? I need to fill the tank with my fluids, and then I need to gradually bring down my blood glucose levels. Um, they might actually need to be admitted to an ICU if their blood sugars are greater than 700. Um, you want to watch for their ventilation. Um, you can see some of that Kuzmal breathing going on. Uh, you want to watch if we actually um, have a shock state, and that would be in relation to that low blood pressure because of the low fluid volume. Um, if the patient is unresponsive, we may need to go ahead and put an NG tube in them, and we would feed them um, via other sources than PO if they're not awake, obviously. And like I said before, we're going to administer that insulin. It would be regular insulin um, is the only one that you could ever administer IV. Hypoglycemia. When we talk about hypoglycemia, um, You want to make sure that you're watching for some of your manifestations. Um, it's hypoglycemia is common with our type 1 diabetes, um, and it's related to um, the insulin reaction. Maybe they took their insulin and then they didn't eat, or they're having a reaction, their insulin, and then they were drinking alcohol or some of the other medications that are out there. Um, or sometimes they are not aware of their manifestations, um, signs and symptoms there with the hypoglycemia. So that would be something you would want to teach your patients early on. So um, a simple one is that cold and clammy, give them candy. Um, not that we really want to give them a whole lot of candy, but we definitely want to make sure that we are um, giving them something to bring that blood sugar up. So what we talk about is um, 15, 15, 15. So we're going to give them 15 grams of a rapid-acting sugar. So we can give them a juice. Um, 
is a common one if they're alert and oriented and can drink, or we can give them something like um, a glucagon tablet um, if their blood sugars are low. So you're going to give them 15 grams of that, and then you're going to wait 15 minutes, check their blood sugar again, and if it's still low, and most facilities policies are less than 70, you're going to go ahead and give them another 15 grams of carbohydrate and you continue doing this until their blood sugars are elevated. Um, the patients do need to be hospitalized if their blood sugars um, are less than 50. It's amazing. Um, your diabetic patients know their bodies very, very well and they're able to actually identify. They can tell when the signs, you know, they can tell those symptoms of hypoglycemia and they'll um, ask you, I know my lunch tray isn't coming for another 30 minutes, but can I get um, some crackers and juice because they can feel it. So we can give them, um, like I said, some juice. We can also give them some glucagon tablets. If they're unable to eat, swallow, um, you can actually give them something called glucagon and you can give that um, sub-Q if need be, IM, or you can um, also do IV. When we talk about um, complications, so now this is more into that chronic piece of diabetes. Um, I told you early on that you're going to see some deterioration of that vasculature and you can see it in both the macro as well as the micro circulation. So our large blood vessels, you're going to start seeing that atherosclerosis set in. Our small blood vessels and capillaries um, are going to be affected. Um, all of those that feed the different organs, especially your kidney as well as your eyes. So that's why you often have your diabetic patient in with renal failure or you have your diabetic patient with blind, um, either blind or deteriorating eyesight. Coronary artery disease, there's a huge link between diabetes and that. Um, coronary artery disease as well as hypertension and stroke and peripheral vascular disease. So it's real important here guys that you start and teach them managing those blood sugars early on. I talked to you a little bit about that visual problems. So you can see diabetic retinopathy. Um, and so what happens here is with our stage one, our non-proliferative, you're going to have dilated veins and you can have um, edema of the macula. As it progresses to stage two, um, you can actually see retinal ischemia. The optometrist will look in that eye and he'll see the cotton wool patches they refer to them as. Um, and then when we hit stage three, there's actually fibrous tissue f that forms and can cause hemorrhage and or retinal detachment um, and they can lose their sight. There's also diabetic uh, neuropathy and so this is going to impair that renal function and if they have hypertension along with the diabetes, it's actually going to accelerate the progression of the neuropathy. Some other complications that we have here is um, peripheral and autonomic um, nervous system. So we can see uh, the thickening of the walls of the blood vessels um, and you can have um, decreased nutrients to the nerves. And what's going to happen here is they're going to um, lose sensation in their fingers um, and their feet. Oftentimes they'll see it in their feet. And so this is one they'll have either numbness, tingling, or they might have some sharp pain. And um, that's why it's so important that we make sure that we t educate the patients on looking at their um, bottom of their feet every single night because you don't want them to step in something, um, step on a nail. I've had many, many patients I stepped on a nail, didn't even realize it, didn't feel it, and um, 
didn't notice it until either the end of the day and then we get into all sorts of problems because their wounds don't heal well because the good nutrients blood flow isn't getting down to that periphery. Um, with our peripheral neuropathies, um, you can also um, see um, carpal tunnel syndrome with these guys. Um, they can oftentimes have numbness in their palm or surface with that fourth and fifth digit in their hand, or sometimes you can see foot drop in these guys. Um, when we talk about the palsy of that third cranial nerve, um, these guys, remember that's your ocular motor nerve, so they can have headaches, eye pain. Um, they will actually have inability to move those that eye up or down or sometimes medially. Um, the red culopathy um, is pain over a dermatome, so um, they can actually lose sensation in, in their skin, cutaneous sensation there if it follows a dermatome. Um, diabetic femoral neuropathy, you'll see pain and weakness there, and then um, what I started off by talking about was the entrapment or compression of the medial nerve, so you can see that carpal tunnel syndrome or that palmar surface with that fourth and fifth digit, the numbness there. Some of the visceral neuropathies, um, sweating dysfunction, you'll have decreased sweating in the hands and feet and possibly increased sweating in the face and trunk. Um, Abnormal papillary function, um, so you'll have constricted pupils. They can also have cardiovascular dysfunction, and so you might see orthostatic hypotension. You might see fixed heart rate with these guys. Gastrointestinal dysfunction, I see this a lot in the clinical setting. These guys have gastroparesis. They oftentimes have um, constipation or pain when they eat, um, and it becomes a very... Um, complicated um, disorder because of the link between trying to get them eating healthy um, and eating meals when they take their insulin and because of that abdominal pain it's difficult to get that regulated. Genital urinary dysfunction, um, they may have inability to empty um, their bladder completely, you may see impotence going on. Um, oftentimes there's alterations in moods with these patients, definitely high, high risk for depression. Um, so that's something that you want to talk to them about and be available for them. Some other chronic complications that we may see with our diabetics, um, increased risk um, for infection which I think you are all aware, um, very difficult once you have a patient come in with a wound um, if they're diabetic to try and get that to heal. Um, so you want to be vigilant about that good foot care um, because you want to be able to prevent it because once they have it, it's difficult to control. Um, periodontal disease progresses more rapidly. Um, so you want to talk to them about good oral hygiene. Um, and the feet, again, I keep talking about that because we see it so often in the clinical setting related to um, the neuropathies and the vascular changes that have gone on here. So when we talk about the feet, um, it's important that um, they look at their feet. And they look at them, you know, every single night before they go to bed. If they're unable to bend over and get down there, either A, have a mirror, something they can hold their foot up to, or have a significant other. But they want to look for cracks and fissures in the skin. They want to look to see if there's any pressure. Um, they have a hard time buying new shoes because breaking in, that can wear and just cause a blister, and that progresses to an actual um, ulcer. Ingrown toenails, it's important that these guys take um, real good care of their nails, that they cut them straight across. Um, they don't want them rounded. And um, they shouldn't be going to um, salons and getting the pedicures or anything like that because you don't want to, um, they're susceptible to the infection. 
Um, oftentimes it can begin as a superficial ulcer that extends deeper down and becomes much more complicated as they progress. So what are we going to do with these guys? We need to make sure they closely control their blood glucose. Um, the better control they have of their blood glucose, the greater chances of reducing their risk of all those complications. So how do we control that blood glucose? We can do it either through, um, like we said, exercise, dietary management, or medications. So some of the different diagnostic tests that we have here are um, our fasting plasma glucose, FPG, fasting plasma glucose. Um, and what we say here is that there's no caloric intake for about eight hours or more. And we're looking for less than 126 with that. We also have um, a two-hour plasma glucose. And this, we're actually going to give them glucose. And um, we want to look at the um, glucose tolerance test for that. So what we say here is symptoms of diabetes um, when we have a plasma glucose test greater than 200, OK? Or when we have a fasting plasma glucose greater than 126. All right, greater than 126 indicates um, diabetes with a fasting, or we do a oral glucose test, and two hours later that um, glucose is greater than 200. Normal fasting glucose should be, like we said, um, 70 to 110. Impaired is um, greater than 100, but less than 126. And that used, to, like I said earlier, we used to say 130, and they've lowered that down to 110 because um, we're trying to catch these people earlier um, in that pre-diabetic stage. So um, in impaired fasting glucose if the blood glucose is greater than 100 but less than 126. We diagnose them as diabeti diabetics with um, a fasting um, plasma glucose greater than 126, and we call them pre-diabetic when it is 100 to 126. It's pretty self-explanatory here on the slides. Diabetes management. When we look at diabetes management, um, we want to look at not only our fasting blood glucose, Okay, so that's something that we can do a finger stick and we can get that. We also want to take a look at our, we refer to it as our hemoglobin A1C. That's our glycosylated hemoglobin. And that's actually looking at your blood glucose over two to three months. Um, and what was happening is <laughs> in the past, our clients would you know, oh, I have a doctor's appointment next week. So they would eat real healthy, and they would come in, and their blood glucose would be great. Yet they're presenting with all of those complications related to diabetes. And so finally, they started doing this hemoglobin A1C, where they're able to say, wait a minute. Your blood sugar might be great today when you're in the office, but I can see how you've been managing it over the past two to three months. And um, I can see that it's elevated. Um, another test um, they talk about is the urine glucose. Um, and they can look for ketones. Just understand that this is not accurate because um, it can actually occur when somebody's nutrition is not normal. Um, so we really don't do our urines, but you might see or hear them. Um, people talk about them and or on our uh, NCLEX. So usually the urine glucose, um, usually your blood sugars are over 180 before it starts spilling over into the urine. Um, when we talk about urine tests for protein, um, if it's positive, you do want to do a 24-hour urine to check for uh, neuro, um, neuropathy, I'm sorry, nephropathy. 
Um, serum cholesterol um, and triglycerides, again, this is trying to see if you fit into that. Um, that metabolic syndrome, and also uh, these guys are higher risk for problems with the cardiovascular system, atherosclerosis, so you want to keep a close eye on those cholesterols. And then your serum electrolytes, again, high risk um, for having electrolyte imbalances, especially when we talk about DK or HH, um, hyperglycemic hyperosmolar. So we need these patients to do some daily monitoring. Um, like I said, the urine testing is not reliable, so we call it our self-monitoring of, of glucose. And actually on our slide here, it has an A. It's supposed to be an S. So self-monitoring blood glucose um, allows the diabetic to monitor as well as try and achieve control over their blood glucose. Um, it's going to decrease the dangers of hypoglycemia, and we encourage them to do it three to four times a day. Um, there's multiple, multiple types of machine and monitoring devices out there. Um, we just want to make sure that your client knows how to use them appropriately and or their significant other. Um, we can also a little bit um, I'm sorry, another thing that's out there is a continuous glucose monitor um, device. So when we talk about monitoring your um, blood glucose level, we need to make sure that the patient is familiar with their equipment and so that they have a lancet. Um, they have strips, make sure the strips are not outdated and also make sure, especially in the hospital setting, that the lot number of those strips correlates with the machine you are using and then you also need the machine or the monitoring device. Um, be aware here that um, clients with higher hematocrit can actually have falsely low blood glucose. Okay, clients with higher hematocrit levels can have falsely low blood glucose level. And those with low hematocrit can have falsely higher blood sugar levels. Medications may cause inaccurate results. Something like vitamin C or uric acid can actually cause those results to be um, inaccurate. And I already said make sure these strips are compatible with the meter. Some of the pharmacology that we use um, definitely would be um, insulin, okay? You'll see that with your type 1 diabetics. Um, it's definitely not a cure. It's just a way that we can manage. Um, and sometimes patients that aren't insulin dependent will need it during stressful situations. So you come into the hospital and you're sick and you've always been able to mon um, manage your glucose with an oral hyperglycemic. Well, now all of a sudden you need to hypoglycemic. Now you need to manage it with a um, actual dose of insulin. So we have stress. Um, we talked about those corticosteroids. We would absolutely use insulin with our DKA or our HHS. Sometimes some the way we feed a patient, um, TPN definitely drives that blood sugar up, as well as tube feedings if they're a high caloric tube feeding. So um, when we talk about insulin, there's several different types. We need to understand that we can have rapid acting, long acting, ultra short acting, medium acting. So we're going to start off here with our insulin Lispro. 
Okay, so this is our rapid acting, um, or our ultra short acting, and then also we have regular insulin, with, which is just a short acting. Um, so when we go back, let me go back here to Humalog. That is a seafood insulin, so um, the onset is less than 15 minutes. They encourage you not to give the insulin until you see the food on the floor, okay? Regular insulin is your sheer, um, short acting. It is clear when it's in the vial. It's the only one that can be given IV, and we use it to treat our DKA and our HHS. NPH is an intermediate acting insulin. Um, this one, it appears cloudy in the vial. It's one that you need to roll between your hands. You don't want to shake it. Um, your insulin glargan is um, one that <coughs> cannot be mixed with other insulins. Um, it has a constant effect, so it works for 24 hours. It does not have a peak time on it. When you're preparing your insulin, make sure that um, you have the right syringe, okay? It is dispensed as units, so you need a syringe that can measure units. And I can't tell you how often, how often I get into the clinical setting and students pick up a tuberculin syringe, and they want to use that, and they're going to measure that. <laughs> use that to measure their insulin, yet their insulin comes in units. So um, you can have it come in two ways. It can be 100 units per ml or 500 units um, per ml. They have to be given parentally, okay? So we're going to give them sub-Q. And um, just be aware of your sub-Q sites. We can also give regular rapid-acting insulins in a continuous infusion device. And you see those a lot of times with your young kids, um, real brittle diabetics. They have better luck managing it using an insulin um, pump, and that administers it for them. It will be placed in their abdomen. Type 2, when we talk about type 2 diabetes, um, we hope to manage it with oral medications, but we can't always do that. So these guys will also be candidates for our insulin. If they're in the ICU or if they have multiple comorbidities and their blood sugars are bouncing up and down, they're also, they will also be a candidate for insulin. Um, with our type 2 diabetics, if we manage their blood sugars and we control them real tight, postoperatively they have decreased risk of infection. Just be aware that you are going to have to make sure you do frequent um, monitoring when you have insulin infusions. So nursing implications. Pumps definitely allow more normal regulation of blood glucose, okay? Lifestyle's a little bit more flexible with these guys. Um, they are actually able to um, have a little bit more flexibility in what they eat, um, just that they need to make sure that they are monitoring um, quite often. The key here is that they need to keep their needle site clean if they do have a pump, um, and there's actual special injection products. Uh, usually when we talk about the pumps, those clients have um, extensive training, and a diabetic educator usually works with those patients on how to work with their pump and how to manage it. So that's really not a focus um, at this level. However, None of you will get out of clinical without giving insulin injections, <laughs> probably multiple, multiple. So what we need to know um, when we're doing our injections, the vials um, of insulin can actually be kept at room temperature up to four weeks. I do know that 
Um, some institutions keep them refrigerated at all times. There's some institutions that use only pens. There's some institutions that use only vials. So that's something you'll learn um, at clinical. Um, just be aware that our regular insulin really does not require any mixing or, or rolling, um, but your other types do require a gentle rolling. Um, you don't want to shake them and get the air in there. As far as our insulin sites, you definitely want to rotate them. Our next slide has a picture showing you all those sub-Q sites. Your diabetic patients are usually very um, familiar, and they'll oftentimes tell you where they want that injection given. Don't massage the site um, after you've given the insulin. Um, as far as techniques to minimize um, painful injections, um, just make sure your insulin's at room temperature. Um, they do talk about um, once you clean it with alcohol to let it dry completely because that can cause some burning. You want to encourage that patient to relax the muscle underneath the area you're giving it. Um, you want to insert that needle quickly. And once you're in, don't do not rotate or change the position of the needle because that will also increase discomfort and never ever um, reuse a needle. Sometimes you can see lipodystrophy or lipoatrophy on patients that use the same site over and over again. So that's why we want to encourage them to rotate their sites and in um, acute care institutions, we actually need to document um, the site that we have given the insulin in. So this next slide is just showing you the different places to administer insulin. Other pharmacological therapies um, is to use with our type 2. Um, we have ones that can actually stimulate or increase the insulin secretion, and we have some that can break down the glycogen to glucose. Um, and they can be oftentimes oral preparations. There is one that's injectable, Bieta. Um, we can oftentimes see these patients on aspirin therapy, and that has to do with that atherosclerosis. Um, that's going on with them. There are multiple hypoglycemic agents out there. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about those, but you'll definitely have the opportunity to see those in clinical. Management of nutrition is really important. They need to have a balanced diet. Um, and we need to make sure we um, kind of look at when they're eating and balance that with when we are administering our medications. ADA does um, recommend that we maintain near normal blood glucose levels. Um, we want our lipid levels to be near optimum and we want our diet to provide adequate calories but we want those calories to be healthy. Um, you can stay within your calorie range, but yet it's being filled with Mountain Dews and Cheetos. So you just want to make sure that they're healthy calories. Um, and we want to prevent and treat complications of insulin. Okay, so remember that insulin can cause the hypoglycemia, and if we need to, we can treat that. Um, and improve the overall health of these clients. So carbohydrate intake is actually individualized with each patient. What ADA is recommending is about 45 to 65 percent of the daily diet is coming from carbohydrates. And when we say that, we want it to come from um, healthy, healthy carbohydrates. So plant foods, um, you'll, you will get your carbs also are found in your milk and some dairy. Um, protein should account for about 10 to 20 percent of your daily um, kilocalorie intake. And again, we want to encourage healthy proteins, so low fat, low cholesterol. Um, remember, we are trying to prevent other complications that oftentimes occur. And fat should be about less than 10 percent of our 
um, daily kilocalorie intake. Fiber, we encourage 20 to 35 grams of um, fiber daily. Remember, constipation is a complication with these guys. Our sodium, we want it to be um, around 1,000 milligrams per 1,000 calories, so really not to exceed 3,000 milligrams in a day. We want to restrict that refined sugar with these guys, and also when we talk about alcohol um, consumption, we want to either avoid it, minimize it, um, we want to recommend those light beers. You don't want the sweet wines, the drinks with the juices. All of that can drive those blood sugars up. Sick day management. So in the acute care setting, this is really what we're going to want to focus on, um, is when you're sick, when you're stressed, those glucose levels go up. So we want to make sure that we're monitoring that blood glucose every um, four at least four times a day, usually it's AC and HS. Um, it says here, test urine for ketones. If our blood glucose is greater than 240, you really don't see that in acute care settings anymore. Um, what we'll do is get a lab draw with our blood glucose level, and usually um, in the acute care policy, you'll read greater than 400. So please check your institutional policy for that. Um, you want to make sure that you continue your normal insulin um, dose. Oftentimes what you'll see is um, the they'll get a regular routine dose of insulin and then they will also get a sliding scale. So if the patient is to get 10 units of Lispro QAM, we'll do that as well as get a blood sugar AC and if the blood sugar um, is elevated, they'll have a sliding scale and let's say the sliding scale is saying to give four more units. So we'll give the 10 for the routine, and then we'll give them the four for that elevated. And that's what you'll see a lot in the acute care settings. Um, and also there will be policies as far as when to call that health care provider. Exercise definitely helps control blood sugars. Um, it keeps them in a nice, even range, so we want to encourage exercise. We want to talk to them about um, managing their weight. Um, you want to encourage them, if they are going on, um, let's say, a bike ride, to make sure they have some type of carbohydrate with them. So if they start feeling the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, they can pull over and eat that snack. Avoid exercising in extreme heat or cold, um, and try and regulate that exercise in conjunction with when they've eaten and when they've given um, themselves their either their injections or taken their medications. As far as surgery goes, um, they're actually investigating. Um, transplanting pancreatic cells, replacing that. Um, just be aware that surgery can alter self-management and we'll oftentimes see hyperglycemia post-op. Um, you can also see that your patient is at very high risk for infection. Um, their wound healing is going to be a little bit slower with our diabetics. Um, they are at higher risk for either hypo or hyperglycemia as well as fluid and electrolyte imbalances. Um, if they are a diabetic, as far as insulin goes, it's very individualized. Um, so you want to make sure you do a thorough preoperative screening. On the day of surgery, you don't want to give any intermediate or long-acting insulin. Um, or if you do, you may need to alter the dosage from what they usually take. Um, and so you oftentimes this is referred to the physician to find out exactly how much um, they want to give. Because sometimes we'll walk in there and the nurse will be like, no, I'm just going to hold everything. And really that may be not the case. Their blood sugar is, you know, 260 before they even go down to surgery. So what they say is um, 
they may receive none. They may get half of usual intermediate or long-acting dose prior and half in the recovery room. Sometimes they'll take the total dose and just divide it into four equal doses. So this is something that you want to make sure that you clarify and that it does not get overlooked on your patient. Um, insulin dose um, with a client with type 1 or type 2 um, with pre-op glucose, you want to take a look and see how high their blood sugar is. If it's greater than 200, they may receive um, greater than 200 may receive IV glucose. Um, so what this is talking about is when your patients are going for surgery and um, their blood sugars are possibly on the low side um, and it's difficult to detect if a patient has hypoglycemia when they are under anesthesia. So they may actually require something to bring their blood sugar up. Um, on the other hand, if their blood sugar is elevated, we need to make sure that they are checking their blood sugar as well um, intraop and postoperatively. So this would be very individualized, and it's just something that we need to make sure that we are following. Um, if the patient is on oral hypoglycemics, sometimes they're actually held um, one to two days before actual surgery. So this is another thing we would just need to make sure we clarify with our health care provider. Um, Education. It is so important that we talk to our patients about um, diabetes, that they understand it, and usually it's not just the individual patient or client. Usually this involves the entire family because who does all the cooking? Who does all the shopping? Um, is the patient actually going to check their blood sugar or are, they go or are they going to have their significant other? Sometimes they'll have a family member from outside come in to check their blood sugar. So you want to make sure they know how to um, manage it all the way around. Um, make sure they are able to identify that hypo or hyperglycemia. Um, make sure they're able to understand um, the lifestyle changes that are going to occur. And it's going to be very difficult to make those lifestyle changes if you're the only one in the house doing them <laughs> and yet your family is still continuing to eat the sweets or the unhealthy food. So it tends to be the whole family is trying to make these changes. We also want to talk to them about some of the complications. So the importance of watching their blood pressure and managing hypertension, um, watching for changes in their vision, um, looking at their feet, watching for infections in the healing, um, and the frequent voiding. So maybe they have a UTI and they don't even realize it. Um, as far as physical assessment goes, we want to make sure that we're looking at that height and weight, okay, and that they are within a healthy, healthy parameters here, and we're looking at those vital signs, okay, and um, their different sensory abilities. So be sure you're asking the questions. Do you have any numbness, tingling? Do you have any pain? What are those peripheral pulses? Instead of being normal, are they weak and thready? Um, that skin, is it nice and moist or is it dry and cracked? Um, when we talk about our older patients, um, just be aware of the normal changes with our older client versus those that are related to the diabetes. And so sometimes um, people just kind of, oh yeah, their skin is dry. Well, it might be dry, but dry, cracked skin is not typical of our aging, and so um, is this diabe diabetic, or I know they're diabetic, and <laughs> it's dry and cracked, and now I have increased risk for infection. With our children, um, make sure that you're paying attention to that hydration status. Um, it won't take long um, for them to become dehydrated, especially during those warm months if they're involved with sports. Um, with those guys, lots of peer pressure with their eating, so we want to make sure that we're doing lots of education. Um, 
with them about how to manage um, their diet and their nutrition. Um, when we look at the family, assess for their coping. What are their strengths? Are they able to handle this? Is this something that the significant other is willing to make changes? Or are they standing there saying, I have no intention. I've been cooking this way for 40 years, and I'm not changing how I cook. Um, so then maybe it's, OK, you can still use the gravies, but is there a way we can maybe make the gravies a little healthier? What are the resources out there? Um, what does the community offer them? When we talk about different nursing diagnoses, there's quite a few that would fall under here. And I'm sure um, this is not an all-inclusive list, but knowledge deficit, that would be high priority. And when we talk about knowledge, um, anytime you guys look at that and use that um, in a care plan or a concept map, make sure the first thing you're going to do is assess what the patient already knows. You want to know where your starting point is. Um, skin integrity, um, risk for infection, risk for injury, especially if they have numbness, tingling. Maybe they're not feeling uh, and they're not picking their foot up high enough and maybe they can trip over those rugs or their vision is impaired. Um, fluid volume, especially when the blood sugar um, goes up, we're going to have that osmosis and it's going to pull and they're going to lose that volume. Sexual dysfunction can occur um, because of that impotence, ineffective coping we spoke of. So the next several slides here are going to talk about um, different, the plan and the implementation of these interventions for patients um, related to some of the different diagnoses. Please read, read through those prior to class, um, and we will apply this to a case study. Um, Diabetes can be a very, very large, daunting topic. Um, it's impossible to go through healthcare without um, coming in contact with clients with diabetes. So um, this should give you a, an overview. Um, please refer to your book um, for any questions. And in class, we will be going over um, case studies and some other interactive strategies to help um, cement this topic as well as bring you to the level of application. Thank you.